Hey guys, welcome back to the Hit Up Rugby League podcast. Today we don't have Connor and Liam, but we do have 300 game NRL player Scott Prince. How are you doing, Scott? Yeah, good, thank you. Yourself? I'm doing all right. It's it's tough without the two other hosts, but I think we'll do well. I think we'll be all right. But yeah, normally what we do is we do a set of six things to start off with, just six quick fire questions just to get to know our guests. So we might as well okay. get underway. So favorite fast food? Favorite fast food, I'd have to say uh, Mexican at the moment. So Guzman and Gomez. Yeah. Uh, best yeah. vacation spot? Best location spot? Um, I would have to say the beach somewhere. So whether it's sunny coast, Gold Coast, but yeah, anywhere near the, anywhere near the ocean. Yeah. Funniest teammate? Funniest teammate? Oh, wow. Um, oh, I'd probably say Brent Tate. Yeah, he's a funny bugger. Tight <laughs> bugger too. Tight with his money. Yeah. Very tight. <laughs> Bring back the biff, yes or no? Yeah, yeah, I don't mind it. Yeah, why not? We um we highlight the the major parts and the the highlights of the games, in particular state of origin, and worrying about the big hits and, and a little bit of a little bit of a biffo too. So it's part and parcel of the game. Why not bring it back? Uh, worst rate roommate to room with. Ooh, well, I've been pretty fortunate. I didn't have to room with too many, uh, but there is one particular player that I spent ooh, probably majority of my career, seven or eight years, uh, was Anthony LaFranchi. He um, he wasn't the worst, but certainly some of the, the, the sounds and smells that were coming out of him, yeah, I'd have to say Buffer. <laughs> uh, and finally, 2022 Premiership prediction, like who's going to win? Oh, mate, I'd have to say uh, pretty confidently in uh, Penrith Panthers going back to back. Yeah, I agree with you. So we've got that right mm. together. <laughs> um, and the next yeah. thing we do is we do a trivia. We do one trivia question on something about your career. Normally, we just look it up and search up like fun fact about Scott Prince or something like that. But we've come up with one here. Which NRL team did you win the most amount of games against? So you played 24 games against this team and you beat them 18 yep. out of 24 times. 18 out of 24. I would say, oh, um, I don't know. Uh, it'd either be maybe, um, uh, what's, who's a team? Probably, oh, man, yeah. Raiders. Uh, it was the Cowboys, actually. It's like, wow. I know, yeah. We, I think we've asked four trivia questions in our recent interviews and every person has got them wrong. It's like, it's crazy because yeah, you just don't remember that sort of thing. No, you don't. <laughs> no, not at all. That, oh, that, that team didn't even come to mind. Thank yeah. you, Cowboys. <laughs> I know I lost a lot for them. Yeah. But I used to, yeah, I lost, I won a wooden spoon with the Cowboys. How good's that? That's, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, mm. We actually have a, our other host, Connor, is a Cowboys fan, and he wanted to know who were some of your players when you were at the Cowboys that were fun to be around and stuff like that. Um, there were quite a few. Uh, Nolly Goldthorpe, was, uh, he was recru recruited um, through the Super League year. So I was only young at the time. I would have been only like 17, 18 when I was at the Cowboys. So for those who don't know, I was recruited um, and was on scholarship with the Cowboys. So I left my hometown of Mount Isa, moved across to Townsville, and... Uh, so, yeah, my first rule encounter, I guess, in terms of um, that professionalism and knowing the game was, uh, was under the guidance of Noly Goldthorpe. He was a, a really uh, experienced halfback, played for St. George, um, and also we picked him up from uh, the Adelaide Rams through that Super League era. So, um, yeah, he was very fun to be around. And the good thing is that we're really good mates today, so we get to catch up. Uh, he lives on the sunny coast, and we play in these Legends of League games as well, so... We usually argue who is the uh, who wears the number seven. So it's either him or myself. But um, we we share the role. He's normally number seven occasionally, and I throw the six on play five eight. But Goldie and one of the all time greats um, that joined us late in my sort of stint there at the at the, at the goal um, at the Cowboys. Sorry, is a is a gentleman by the name of Tim Brasher, an absolute superstar of the game. Um, obviously played at uh, at Belmain Tigers. Uh, played at South and then also went up to the Cowboys. And, um, yeah, he was the next step. And I, I looked at him and I thought, geez, 
you play alongside first graders, but in terms of a good first grader to a to a great footballer, he uh, just watching him and training beside him and watching him in games, like he was next level. So Timmy Brasher. Yeah. So then you obviously moved on to the Broncos and struggled with some injuries. How did you feel at that mm-hmm. point in your career and how tough was that dealing with all those injuries? Mate, it was very tough, um, especially the first uh, year at the, at the Broncos in 2001. Um, yeah, so, you know, losing my mentor and my best mate in, in my father, in, uh, and that's, you know, something that I really um, struggled to deal with, you know, in, in a car accident. So he passed away and I was just only two or three weeks after my 21st birthday. So um, that was quite confronting and a, and, a, and a big deal um and then only months after I, I broke my leg so as you know you know injuries are part of the game you know that's nature of the beast but to do that and then do it again when I come back uh in 2002 so I had 11 months off um yeah I really really struggle with that not only physically but also mentally whether you know you have doubts whether you can be the player you were and and improve um and, and get better you know and, and hit that potential that I guess everyone talks about and, and even yourself, your expectation on, on what you want to achieve in your career. Yeah. One player that this were going to the Tigers now for you is that everyone talks about, you probably get this a lot as Benji. What was he like when you were at the Tigers and how exciting was he to play with? Yeah, mate, he was a, he was an absolute freak talent. Um, and so raw, so young, uh, but you know, when I left the Brisbane Broncos, um, you know, I didn't want to leave, to be quite honest. And and uh, when I got the opportunity to reunite with the coach and Tim Sheen, so I, he actually debuted me at the Cowboys. So he was my first ever NRL coach. Um, and then it just so happened that he became the coach of the West Tigers. I was off contract. And then he offered me uh, an opportunity down there for three years. And uh, he spoke about, um, you know, like uh, some of the young kids that were coming through. You know, there was Robbie Farrar, uh, Bryce Gibbs, also Liam Fulton, and the list goes on. But there was one particular player that everyone knew about, you know, obviously going through the junior ranks and, um, you know, the Gold Coast, uh, the high school, uh, you know, superstar and, and Benji Marshall. And um, and I actually watched a lot of the West Tigers before I joined them. And he was certainly a player I was excited to meet, but also play alongside. And I remember the first day of I met him for the first time was the fact that he was walking out of the gym at the West Tigers there, the Concord Oval. I was walking in and you could just feel and sense there was just a, a, a real common ground between him and I um, and, and a real good friendship and a bond that we that obviously grew over the time I spent with him. So for me, an absolute superstar of the game and a, and a real inspiration to to all, especially he's not the, he's not the biggest guy, nor myself, but what he had to go through of you know multiple shoulder reconstructions on both shoulders and able to stay in the game for a long period um i think his career went for like 16 17 years uh to win a golden boot um was outstanding for his country in new zealand uh and is certainly a player that every kid wanted to step like benji marshall and flick pass like benji so um my experiences with him great player even better bloke yeah so going back to tim sheens obviously he's known as not one of the all-time greats, but definitely one of one of the great coaches. What was he like mm-hmm. as a coach, like behind the scenes, and is he like what people would expect? Mate, I I, I put him in the category of one of the great coaches. Um, when you look at what's um, available even today, like there there are some really really good coaches and there's some great coaches, but Tim's one of those coaches that has lasted so long in the game and. The other guy that springs to mind is obviously Wayne Bennett. And, and these are the guys who are like, you know, like, a, you know, like almost like gods of, of, of coaching at the moment. And they, they sit above some of these young rookie coaches at the moment. Um, and the way my experiences with him is that I had him at a young age and I was very fortunate because the way he broke the game down was so simple. Um, he's not your average coach. He thinks outside the square. Um, he was trialing things that, would he'd go to the NFL over in, obviously in America and bring back new ideas and he always thought outside the you know what everyone was doing the mainstream sort of stuff so he was you know doing like um you know the black mark under the eyes you know just so the, the fullbacks and wingers could catch a footy just take the glare off the eyes so he was doing sweatbands um so it was easier to catch especially up in Townsville you know the stopping the the moisture and the dew on your hands um 
Uh, I remember a, a, a day at training, he he got me to wear headphones. You know, they don't have uh, these AirPods nowadays, <laughs> like actual headphones with a headband strapped around. I looked like a, an old 70s basketballer. Um, and we're sitting in the crowd and we just did like a, um, a bit of a scrimmage. So against our reserve grade team, and he was actually telling me what plays to run. So it was almost like he was sitting up playing like a bit of a PlayStation game, trying to tell the halfback what to do. So um, he was trying things. And this was back, that was back in 1999, sort of 2000. So like his, his knowledge and more so innovative um, approach to the game has been first class. So for me, I, I, I certainly owe a lot to Tim in terms of my knowledge and understanding and philosophies which I apply now because I do a little bit of coaching myself. And, um, yeah, I put him as the best coach I've ever had. So he's certainly someone I respect. And um, and it's great to see he's still involved in the game. Yeah. So with that 05 Tigers team, could you tell early on in the season that you guys could be a grand final team? Or was it one of those things that was a slow burner and as the season went on? Well, we actually set a... Um, a team goal, uh, you know, 2004, the year before, we missed out on playing in the semis. Uh, West Tigers have never played semi-final football before, okay? So we sat down, and it was Tim, it's Tim's sort of idea uh, that we come up with a, a team goal, and off the back of that team goal, we'd have individual goals that would obviously achieve um, and where we need to be to achieve our team goal. So we come up with the team goal of making the top four. Uh, at that point, obviously, in the NRL and the competition, no team outside the top four has ever won a, uh, a premiership. So I thought if we make the top four, that gives us it gives ourselves an opportunity to win one because you get a home final and so on. Um, and when we did that, we wanted to display that at training, you know, make signs up at training, put it on everywhere so everyone could see it. We were proud of the fact that that's what we wanted. Um, people thought we were mad. They're like, what? The West Tigers want to make the top four? That's the team going? They are crazy. And for me, I thought we were a little bit out there also. <laughs> but it's what we did behind those four walls that really mattered, I suppose. And, and building confidence and self-belief with the team uh, each and every week, um, that's where you start to um, start to change people's minds. And, and it's a real good, good message in that too. It's, not, it's like, it doesn't matter what other people think, it's what we think. Um, so throughout the year, to answer your question, no, I didn't think that we we're going to win it that year. Um, but it was a slow burner. And in round 13, we were coming 13th in the competition. All right. And when they start mentioning this word mathematically, they can make it. That scares the hell out of me. All right. So, so Tim's like, all right, guys, come in. We need to have a meet. We need to reevaluate where we're at in terms of our team goal. We're coming 13th in round 13. So halfway of the comp. So we sat down and Tim's like, okay, mathematically, we could still make the top four. But what do you want to do? Do you think we can make it? Do you think we can't make it? Do you want to reassess your team goal? And we sat around for about five minutes. And it was one senior player, his name's Ben Galea. He stood up and goes, no, our, to our team goal at the start of the year was to make the top four. If we can still make it, that's what we need to stick with. And at that point, that inspired everyone looked around and went, yeah, well, that we can do it. We can still do it. On round 13, we went on a nine-game winning streak. All right, we found ourselves in the top four. Um, and the rest is history. So... You know, we, that's when that through that period, we were just winning games and the self-belief within the team and the confidence that we played with uh, and still had the critics around saying, no, they're no good, they're too small, they got young halves, all the rest of it that comes with it. Um, but it, it mattered, you know, what mattered the most was what we believed and, and what we showed on the park. And yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a crazy old year, but it was certainly good at the end. Yeah. Yeah, as a Warriors fan, I hate the mathematical chance thing. It gets me every year. Oh, <laughs> we'll <see that> side. <laughs> oh don't worry. I've heard it quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to that 05 grand final. Obviously, you're a captain and won the Clive Churchill medal. What was the lead up like in the week? And what was the feeling like when mm. the job was actually done? Well, they talk about grand final week as the most enjoyable, most exciting week of your life. Uh, for me, I, I have to disagree. Um, <laughs> You know, when, you, when you're going into a big game like that, as much as you try not to think it's a big game, it's you're living your childhood dream. Like every footy kid wants to play in the grand final. Um, so every night, every moment in, 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 in during the day when you're just sitting there, you know, you, it, it just goes over in your mind and you just try to try not to think about it because you don't want to burn uh, nervous energy. 
So every night you lie on a bed and straight away, I mean, there's only two teams left. You know, the whole world's watching. And, uh, and you think you only get, you potentially only going to get one crack at this, you know, because it's so hard making a grand final. So you're just trying not to think about it. And it's just been constant, you know. So I'm thinking, oh, you, you can't sleep. Or like, I'm pretty nervous at the best of times. So, I mean, the grand final, the grand final brekkie where you face off, you know, we do like an interview and the Cowboys were sitting on that side and we were sitting on this side. They do, you know, the co- uh, coaches' interviews, the captains' interviews. And they put brekkie in front of you. And everyone's pretty much watching you. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to eat this just in case I either, you know, vomit or, or, or comes out the other end. So I'm like, I'm so nervous. I don't even want to worry about this. So like, to be honest with you, I could not wait to take the field. I remember the moment when we're getting dressed in the dressing room, um, all the players, you know, obviously spoke to their partners and had some um, opportunities to have some photos. So, you know, me and uh, Spud Alford, Shane Alford, um, he, I spent a lot of time with him. He was my sort of neighbour, I guess, and we, we we lived in Penrith. So his, his wife and him put, like, pictures up of my daughters, and he put that in my dressing, um, uh, sort of dressing room in my little locker. And, and I did the same as well with him and, you know, just some special moments that we could look at um, during and in, in the lead-up of the, the game in terms of our, before our warm-up and so forth. And I felt more comfortable when I took the field and I thought, this is it. This is what I've been dreaming about. And this is, I can't believe I'm playing right now. So my nerves just went away. I, I felt a, calm, uh, a sense of calmness when I took the field. And I thought, this is what I've been waiting for. And it was, it was sort of meant to be that sort of feeling. But um, great moment. Um, and to celebrate with a group of men that, you know, you sweat, cry, bleed with um, right in, at the start. So like November is our preseason and lead up to so 2004 November. That's what rugby league's all about, and I'm just so happy to win one. Yeah, talking about like a childhood dream, I guess Queensland would be another dream of yours. What was that like mm-hmm. to make your debut? And yeah, what was that like? Oh, mate, you could not wipe the smile off of my my face. You know, it was like a I tell people it's like a bit of a Stephen Bradbury story. To be quite honest, like I I went down to the Tigers. I was injury. I mean, I was tagged injury prone. So prior to that 04, when I got my opportunity. Um, uh, I was I only played 20 NRL games uh, as far as at that club. So in three years at the Bronx, I only played 20 games. So I've come in, West Tigers, here I am. I need to establish myself as a first-grade player. All of a sudden, every halfback of 5'8", known to man in Queensland, either picked up an injury or, or, or you know, they're out of form or whatever it may be. All of a sudden, I got the call-up. Prince, you're in. You're playing, you're playing uh, State of Origin here. I'm thinking trying to establish, my, to establish myself as a first grader first and foremost. And I thought, wow, this is another, as you said, this is another dream of mine. I used to watch Origin as a kid back home in Mount Isa. Um, my brother, I, I think he still supports the Blues, which is uh, I still can't fathom. Uh, so we'd push the lounge chairs aside and take the pillow off and play on our knees. We had, you know, um, carpet burns on our knees trying to play rugby league uh, on the lounge room floor back home. Um, but it was certainly a dream. Um, and... To actually play Origin for Queensland uh, for, on five occasions is something that I hold dear to my heart. And uh, when you're representing your state, and um, especially when you've got my own blood running through you, uh, it's always a proud moment. Yeah. Could you tell there was something special brewing within the Queensland camp at the time, or was it a bit early, do you think, for it? Well, I was sort of a part, a part of like the, I wouldn't say a rebuild, but certainly a phase of, of greatness that come through. And, and that's what it was like. It was sort of like, um, I played in 04. Uh, there was two guys that were, weren't part of that squad, two guys. And, and then, then they added, uh, you've probably heard of this dude, his name, Jonathan Thurston, uh, to, to, to the squad. And then all of a sudden from 05 or 06, that's when they started to win. And, and, and the good thing about it is that, most of those guys stayed fit and healthy. So they played a lot of consecutive origins, you know? So I think, you know, JT in particular, he, he played almost 33, 36 straight origins. So that's every game for almost 10 years, 11 years, you know what I mean? So to keep that combination, that experience on the park at all times. And we went through an era of like some great footy players, you know, like Billy Slater, uh, Cameron Smith, JT, you got some old heads in there, Steve Price, uh, Petro Seven Aceva, um, some 
you know, outside backs are all full of experience as well. So it was a great period. And I was just so fortunate and so happy to be a part of that. And, and uh, when I got a recall in 2008, so I had to wait four years to pretty much get my opportunity. Um, you know, I mentioned Darren Lockyer also. Like Darren Lockyer was a, is, a, is a legend and, you know, like a freak of our game. So, and it wasn't until an injury occurred that I got my opportunity um, only because I was playing, still playing, you know, half decent footy at the time that I got my chance again. So it was such a hard team to get into. But when you're sitting back as a Queensland and they're winning footy games, you've got to be happy with that too. Yeah. I was started becoming a New South Wales fan around 2009, 2010. Like some, I was born in 2002. So it's pretty yeah. hard start to origin footy to watch for me. But yeah, it's good to Why? Look. I want to ask you a question. Why? Why New South Wales? Is that because of the underdog tag? Well, it's just because we're obviously us three are from New Zealand. So you sort of just mm. one day you're like, well, my dad's a New South Wales fan. I don't know why. Oh, there you go. Family. So it's like, but in New Zealand, it's just you sort of pick one and just ride with them, I guess. It's a yeah, bit, you just stick with it. Yeah, there's not really much thought that goes into it, but yeah. Um, That's all right. Yeah. Another big thing that was tough for me when I first started getting into it was how good the Aussies were. And obviously you got to play for them a few times as well. How did that feel to like sing the national anthem and things like that? Mate, like, to represent your country in any form um, of anything, you know, is, is an absolute honour. And to get that opportunity, um, I got my first crack. It was, a, uh, I think it was after the, the grand final in 05. We went on a route tour of England. Um, yeah, that was that was an experience in itself. So to play over there up against you know the, the Poms, I never had the chance to play against New Zealand, yeah. which I'm devo about. I would have loved to have stood there um, and watched you know them pre- perform the haka in front of us um, and just enjoyed that experience for for what it is. I, I got so much respect you know for New Zealand and for all the other countries that are you know that play in the on the international stage. But to wear that green and gold. Um, on, on I think my might, might, might be five occasions as well. Um, was also part of the World Cup in two thousand and eight. That's when New Zealand beat yeah. us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. When uh, Billy Billy Slater, you know, threw that wayward pass and Ben, you picked it up at Suncorp. So yeah, that certainly hurt. I was sitting in the crowd watching that. But um, yeah, no, to represent Australia uh, at any form of um, sport or anything, anything it may be, is an absolute honour to wear the green and gold. Yeah. The thing that I mostly know you for, like I remember around 2008, 2000, um, probably but maybe 2008, 2009 is I used to get the mm. rugby league weeks every week and I saw you with the Titans jersey on and that's like my first real memory of you and I was wondering what it's <laughs> what it's like to be like a marquee signing of a brand new side and like a co-captain. What was that like? Yeah, it's certainly um, something that not many players get the opportunity to do, yeah, especially when there's a new franchise that are coming into the comp. So Obviously, next year, we've got the Dolphins that are coming in. So there's a few players that will get to experience that. So for me, coming off the back of the, you know, my journey as far as being a Cowboy, uh, Bronco at that early stage, and then also the West Tigers, I was able to pick up some really positive um, ways of, of, uh, you know, cultural ways and values that, that I knew that worked. And there's certainly things that I, you know, I wouldn't take along. And I tried to help instill that into the into the Gold Coast team you know values that what what it means to be a Gold Coast Titan so that and the fact that you know becoming a co-captain alongside um you know one of the good players and great players in, in Luke Bailey was uh was, was something you know something special as well but I was more around not only not only be there as a leader but also someone that would also share some knowledge and experience and help build what it means to be a Gold Coast Titan so I'm hoping that legacy is still in and around that club. And then there's some things that we used to do back in the day uh, are still there present today that they, you know, breathe and live by. So it was a great experience, you know, moving to the Gold Coast. It was a brand new team on the comp. Um, they certainly had their their teams over the over time. And we just wanted, we just didn't want to be a team that only lasted five years and they were going out of the competition. We wanted to be a team that, that the community of the Gold Coast and Northern Rivers and anyone in that area uh, would be proud of, and uh, that certainly for me was a was a, was a was certainly another proud moment in my in my career. Yeah, and to this day, you're still their highest point scorer. 
because you had to do the goal kicking obviously was that mm. did you enjoy doing that or was that something that sort of did you enjoy it or yeah well I, I kicked as a uh, as as a high school kid as well like I, I enjoyed the um you know the pressure moments and um, when I was playing, there were obviously some better kickers than me, and it wasn't really on my priority list, to be quite honest, because I still wanted to, you know, evolve my game as, a, as not only a directive halfback. Um, you know, I had, you know, I work really hard on my kicking game as well. I believe that's a real strong point of my game as well, as well as my direction and so forth. Um, it's quite doc. It's quite doc- documented the fact that I not a strong tackler, a tackle, and uh, and I just kind of laugh about it because I tell the boys like. You know, I'm still running around now, and they, the boys have got short, sore shoulders and so on from from doing all my tackling back in the day. So we have a bit of a giggle, but the the goal kicking thing sort of developed as I got older, and and I, I believe the reason why I wanted to take it on because I felt like you know that was another challenge that I needed in my career. You know, I felt like I was sort of on top of things that I needed to be on top of, and I felt that I needed to adopt the goal kicking because I wanted to, um, I wanted to be challenged. And I thought if we were going to win footy games and, and you see, you know, those close games are missed on missed goals and penalty goals and stuff like that, like by two, four points. And if I can, if that's on me to make the difference to winning or losing, well, I'm happy to wear that. So, um, and I thought I was mature enough that if I missed a goal that would potentially lose a game, you know, for example, I'd be the one to go, okay, and process it and go, and go, yep, sweet. That's just a part of rugby league. That's a part of life and move on quite easy. Yeah. Uh, one last question about the club aspect of it. If like a team was to win now, a grand final out of your four teams, mm-hmm. who's the team you're supporting now? Because you obviously played for four. Is there a certain team that's closer to your heart? or? Well, I currently work at the Broncos. So when you're in an, uh, an organisation like that and, don't get me wrong, you know, it's a team that I supported as as a young kid also, and uh, my family support them as well. Uh, my old man was a Broncos supporter. So there are some, you know, there have been some um, really good times of one of the most successful clubs in the NRL today. Um, so when you got a close connection with a club like that, as, as and you're there every day, you get to feel it and see it and, and know how much the players work and you get to know the players. So so me being out of the game now, I've almost become a fan of the game. And I want to see my old teams win and do well and actually play some decent footy. But obviously the Broncos, I want them to, I want them to do well, especially off the back of the last two slim, you know, seasons that they've had. Because, you know, they've been so used to being a successful team. And right now they've been challenged, you know. They haven't the, – some, the, some of the moments in, their, in the last two years especially – you know, they have, this is uncharted territory for them. So I love that fact that they are going through, I would call it a rebuild. I would call it a, um, a reflection time and learning where they're going to have to get back to the to the yesteryear of, of what our great players have done at the Bronx and not, not be like them, but to certainly draw inspiration from them, but start their own legacy. And that's what, that's where the Bronx are at at the moment. So I want them to win for sure. Yeah. Um, now, going to the All-Star game, I know that's something that's quite close to your heart. You got to play for the Indigenous All-Stars. How important is that mm. game for you, and how do you enjoy watching it, obviously? Oh, mate, it is, it is, um, it is certainly one, um, one of a kind. Um, you know, when you're representing your, your heritage, your culture, and so not only, you know, you as, a, as an Aboriginal, proud Aboriginal man, because um, I'm from the Calcutin tribe, and we're representing every, all the mob across, not only Australia, but also the world, wherever they may live. So um, I was fortunate enough to play, as you said, I think on four occasions, maybe five occasions with with the Indigenous All-Stars. And to be part of the inaugural one, the first ever, alongside a really good friend of mine, Preston Campbell, which, as we know, it's, it's, it was his idea. So he spoke about it in 2007. And to see that develop, so see his dream become a reality three years later, um, you know, and be a part of that, that is something special. And everyone talks about the game and what a wonderful spectacle that is, but it's what we do during the week. You know, there's, there's a youth summit. So we have a hundred uh, indigenous students from all around Australia who are selected to come over to do a youth summit. So they get to experience like cultural workshops, um, get to do activities and fun certain things with, with, um, not only the men's teams, but also now the women's teams that are a part of it. 
Um, and it, it's about changing lives and in, in, in inspiring others that make the week so fun and, and so special to me. And the game at the end of the week is just the cherry on top, isn't it? It's, it's what, what, not only what we're there for, but also that's what the crowd see, the, the, um, the tribal dancing, the, the whole spectacle of what it is. And, um, yeah, that is certainly something special. And, and the fact that it is still lasting this long, I mean, what are we now, like 12, 13 years later, and it's still pumping. Yeah, I enjoy it. It's just, and I like how it's at the start of the season, you know, like it sort of gives mm. a lot to start of the season now back it to the start. So it's good. But yeah, yeah. Um, one, uh, we've got a couple more questions, but one big one that we like to ask people <laughs> like you that have played a lot of different like things of footy is what was your toughest level? Was it the grand final? Was it the origin? Was it test football? What was like the hardest in your opinion, or is they all sort of similar in different ways? Well, the hardest, and this is with all due respect to some of the games that I have played, but there, there's two hard games that really stand out for mine. Origin footy is the toughest football. I mean, that is fast. The hits are harder. Um, there's not many mistakes. So you, the, the ball and play is obviously a long duration. So your fitness levels are certainly tested. Um, and there's no give. Like you've got 34 absolute legends of the game, the best players at that particular time playing. So there's no room for error, you know, and you're going to get cooked if, you, if you're if slacking off. Uh, there's that. And the second one was the uh, prelim final against St. George. So this is the game to make the grand final. Mate, they, that game is the hardest club football game I have ever played. All right. And, and that's in 16 years of football. I look at that game and think, holy that was up there like as an as a state of origin game and 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 after that knowing that we we won and beat the dragons that certainly gave us the best preparation leading into a grand final yeah and one last thing you obviously ended up playing 300 NRL games one of only 43 people to do it for someone that's injury prone how special is that and how important <laughs> is that be? yeah but like, well at the end of the day like you don't go out to try to get these milestones and um, you know, I look back now and, and reflect on the career and, mate, to be honest with you, as much as it would have hurt, I would have loved to have just played one in a real game and to actually play 300 and be part of this club, I didn't even know existed, to be honest with you. Um, and I was like, I think the 21st or 22nd player to even join that club. And, and the, some of the names that are actually in the 300 club, I just like, I certainly idolised and never thought that I would even be in the the same group or same sentence as some of the names that you, you know, you potentially could mention. So um, yeah, it is something special. Um, the good thing is I get two tickets to an origin game every year. I get two tickets to the grand final every year as being a part of that. And that's, you got to take your hat off to the NRL. You know, that's a great uh, initiative, I guess. Uh, in terms of um, the service that we provide, because it is the entertainment business. Um, and, you know, I remember the week leading into that, I played the, the Broncos in my last game, uh, not the Broncos, the Bulldogs in my last game with the Broncos. And I remember thinking, as when I was re- announced my retirement, it was actually, I think it was on 2 9 1, there's nine games. So I had to play the remaining of that season in every game to make 300. The final week I was at training, I was like, no one touch me. Like, do not hurt me. Do not touch me. At training, I was like, do not touch me. I've got to get, I've got to put foot on that field so I can tick over 300. So, um, yeah, it was a special moment again. Yeah. So, finally, obviously, for some people, retirement can be a tough transition, but you seem to be doing all right, doing coaching and other sort of things. What's some things you'd like yeah. to do in the future? Uh, for me, uh, my goal is to you know, he'd be an, uh, an assistant coach in the NRL. Um, so currently at the moment, uh, I obviously work at the Broncos doing my Indigenous program work as a facilitator and ambassador for the club. Uh, I've been doing that now for seven or eight years. I play a small role in, um, you know, developing our young leaders, Indigenous leaders of the future. Uh, that's something that I'm very passionate for. But I also have a, my own personal dream is, is to coach. So right now I'm in the, uh, the women's space. So I enjoy that and sort of help develop the NRLW as well and share my knowledge and help that game build, but also enjoy that experience as a coach. And it, it certainly tests me and, you know, takes me places where 
Um, I can, you know, take some good things and some bad things also along the way. Um, but yeah, my, my goal is to, is to be an assistant coach to, uh, to an NRL team for sure. Yeah. Well, I wish you good luck in that. And really thank you for this opportunity to have a chat with you. Obviously Connor and Liam couldn't be here, but hope they enjoyed listening to this, but yeah, thank you so much, Scott, for joining the podcast. Thank you. Beautiful. Thanks for having me and enjoy boys and go Queensland, eh? <laughs>